Thank you all for joining us in our 2024 complimentary webinar series covering the FAR, or Federal Acquisition Regulations. We're coming to you live today from Washington, D.C. We're so glad you're here. Okay, so a little bit about the series. As usual, all of our webinars are complimentary and recorded. The FAR has 52 total parts and we'll run through them sequentially each week on Wednesdays and Fridays at noon Eastern time. The recordings and PowerPoints will be posted within 24 hours of the webinar ending. You can find the recordings on our YouTube channel simply by subscribing to it using the link you see on the screen. There is no cost. You can find the PowerPoint on the slide share using our links and credentials to log in. Again, there's no cost. We also offer sponsorship opportunities. If you're interested, please send us an email at hello at jenniferschaus.com. And now how to sign up for the series. Unfortunately, there is no bulk registration. You must register individually for each webinar. If you go to the Jennifer Schaus website, navigate to the section called the FAR, and you'll find the individual registration links. Also, the recording links will be posted here upon completion of each webinar. Please know we covered the FAR in 2020, so if you're eager to get a jump start, please find these historical recordings on our site. Navigate to the webinars tab and scroll down to section the FAR 2020. Because it, has, because it has been four years, many of the regulations have changed and been updated. Please use this as a reference tool only. And now a little bit about us. We work with established federal contractors worldwide, helping them navigate the market. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. Some of the contract vehicles we support are listed here on your screen. For more information, please visit our website. Okay, and those were our services for federal contractors. We also provide marketing and advertising services for organizations who are selling to federal contractors. You can add extra muscle to your marketing efforts via our newsletter ads and webinar sponsorships to in-person events. Please email us and ask for our media kit. Speaking of events, we hope you'll join us at the John F. Kennedy Center on Monday, February 12th for an evening of networking. Our winter soiree will bring in about 300 federal contractors as well as confirmed attendance from HHS, the VA, Air Force, NAVAIR, NAVC, NSWC, the State Department, and SBA. Please register in advance on our website under events as tickets generally sell out. We hope to see you there. Please join us in the Virginia Apex Accelerator for a complimentary webinar class on marketing to the U.S. federal government and prime contractors. Jennifer will present and answer your questions in this two-hour webinar. Registration is free. Please sign up on our website under events. This webinar is Thursday, February 15th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Please join us at our friends at the Michigan Apex Accelerator next month on Thursday, March 28th, as we delve into the GSA schedule basics. This webinar is also complimentary and can be found on our website under the events section. Is your business pursuing the Homeland Security contract vehicle and need a compliance matrix or full proposal support? We for assistance with a DHS PAX contract. Please email us for a quote at hello at jennifershaus.com. We can also support your business with proposal help on the upcoming NASA soup contract. Again, we offer anything from a compliance matrix to a full hand holding and proposal support. Hello at Jennifer Schaus is the email to use to contact us for help. Please join us on March 12th for a webinar from my team at the Federal Forecasting app. They will discuss and demo how the app allows users to engage and build relationships, including teaming partners and more. Again, this is recorded and complimentary. Please also join us on March 14th at noon for a complimentary webinar with our friends at Agile ATS. If you're looking for recruiting and hiring best practices, strategies, and tactics, please be sure to tune into this lively discussion. Agile ATS provides government contractors with a software platform for hiring and more. Again, this is recorded and complimentary. MyGovWatch has recently conducted some research with government buyers. They will share the results of these findings with us on March 26th in a complimentary webinar. MyGovWatch will debunk the myths about RFIs, RFQs, and RFPs so you can find out what's really going on behind the scenes. Again, the wedding is recorded and complimentary. A little later in June, we'll hear from the Kerry Palmetier on small business innovation in federal contracting. Specifically, Kerry will cover information on SBIRs and STTRs. These two options are a great way for tech companies to grow in the federal sector. 
This is a two-part series. As always, these are recorded and complimentary. Our webinars are complimentary thanks to our long, long time and generous corporate and in-kind sponsors. Please allow me to introduce them. We would like to thank our friends at GovEvent, the premier platform for posting events related to government and government contracting. You can find all of our webinars and our events on GovEvents.com, as well as recordings from our past 600 plus webinars. We also wanna thank Tom Johnson and his team at Set Aside Alert, the go-to publication for contracting opportunities for small, women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, and 8A firms. Visit setasidealert.com for more information. The Fairfax Economic Development Authority has online calendars of events and webinars. We want to thank them for posting our events and webinars on their calendars. The Virginia Apex Accelerator at George Mason University offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to establish, establish government contracting firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore their resources, review homework recommendations, register for live training, and find useful links to agencies and other self-directed learning. One-on-one -on -one counseling is limited to eligible client companies. Appointment requests are handled in the order they were received and based on counselor availability due to high demand. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. Join the Greater Reston Chamber of Commerce's monthly GovCon Council meeting to network with contracting peers, learn about upcoming events, opportunities, and also contribute to future programming. The meetings take place the fourth Wednesday of each month at 8.30 a.m. at the Greater Reston Chamber of Commerce. The next meeting will be on Thursday, Tuesday, February 27th. Please contact Alicia Field if you have questions about the meeting. Alicia's email is at the bottom of your screen. Do you want help winning government contracts? Bitspeed can help. Users can find contract opportunities from federal, state, and local government. Additionally, you can search for teaming patterns, incumbent point of contact, expiring contracts, compliance matrices, and also proposal templates. Create your login today at bidspeed.com. Bidspeed is an official partner of the U.S. Small Business Administration's E2G Empower to Grow. Events are the ultimate engagement channel to bring government and industry together. 68% of government personnel report that they attend more than one event each year. The Federal Business Council, or FBC, has worked with government and industry for 45 plus years to create gatherings where ideas are shared and to help government achieve its goals. This includes agency industry days, cybersecurity symposiums, technology expos, and offsite meetings. FBC provides full life cycle meeting planning and event management, with over 5,000 meetings under their belt, FVC has the experience, systems, and personnel to make your next event exceptional. Learn more at www.fbcinc.com. Please check out our friends over at GovBrew. GovBrew is the most read GovCon newsletter, keeping thousands of GovCon professionals in the loop with news, updates, and opportunities in the federal contracting market. All in a fun and accessible email that only takes five minutes to read. And it's 100% free to join. It goes out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 a.m. It's filled with great content, event postings, webinars, and more. We encourage you to sign up at govbrew.co or you can use the QR code you see on the screen. Okay, now let's meet today's speaker. Please welcome Connor Farrell to the webinar. We're honored to have you with us today and we're excited to hear your presentation on the FAR. We appreciate the time it took you, you took to put together this content. Connor, I'll put myself on mute and turn the floor over to you. Please let me know when you're ready for your next slide and I'll advance them as we discussed. Okay, great. Um, so thanks so much for having me here today. Um, my name is Connor Farrell. Uh, I am an associate at Miller and Chevalier uh, where I focus on all things government contracts, whether it's uh, bid protests, contract disputes, uh, compliance with the FAR, um, all that good stuff. Um, before my time uh, at Miller, I worked for a large defense contractor in their uh, contracts and business development department. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, today, we will be discussing FAR Part 5, Publicizing Contract Actions. Uh, excited to be talking about this today um, as Part 5 sort of provides the, the framework for how information is presented to large and small businesses. Um, it's sort of, it's one of the beginning steps in uh, the procurement life cycle. So it's, it's important to understand part five um, and sort of allows industry to you know, set themselves up for success uh, throughout the process. 
Uh, next slide, please. So uh, first, let's go over our agenda for today. Um, we will first touch on some important definitions to know uh, as we go through the requirements of part five. Uh, and then we'll talk about the publication of contract actions. Uh, you know, what kind of information the government is required to provide. Um, you know, then we'll discuss when the government is and is not required to provide notice of contract actions. And then we'll also briefly look at some of the other subparts in part five uh, that cover uh, availability of solicitations, uh, subcontracting opportunities, and publication requirements surrounding contract awards. And then and finally, we'll conclude our discussion uh, with um, a little bit about the benefits of part five and you know how how it fits into to the acquisition life cycle and how it can benefit both government and industry. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have two important definitions to know as we go through this presentation. Uh, first, let's define a contract action. Uh, FAR 5.001 provides that a contract action is an action resulting in a contract. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that's too helpful, but uh, this also includes actions for additional supplies outside the existing contract scope, right? So that's that's a little bit more helpful there. It's uh, Important to note that a contract action does not include actions within the scope of the existing contract. So if you think about uh, contract modifications issued pursuant to the changes clause or um, modifications that are purely funding actions or, or you know, purely making administrative changes, um, those type of, of modifications, they don't meet this definition of contract action for the purposes of part five. And so they're not going to be subject to any of the publication requirements that we're going to talk about here. A second definition uh, that we uh, need to understand is government wide point of entry or GPE. And this is the single point where government business opportunities can be accessed electronically by the public. And so we're going to get into the spe specifics of this more in a little bit, but generally speaking, contract actions or opportunities valued at greater than $25,000 need to be posted to the GPE. The FAR states that the GPE is SAM.gov, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, Back in 2021, it changed over. It used to the GPE used to be FBO.gov or FedBizOps, but since 2021, it's it's now SAM.gov. And it, it's important to note that SAM.gov, because it is defined as the GPE, is the only place that satisfies the publication requirements of Part Five. So you know we've seen protests where an agency will post a contract action, a proposed contract action to their own website. And they think that that satisfies the requirements of part five. And those protests have actually been sustained. Uh, you know, GAO has found that that does not satisfy the requirements of part five, that they did not post it to the GPE, to SAM.gov, they used their own website. And so that was not sufficient. So whenever there's a requirement to post to the GPE, we just need to understand that means it has to be posted to SAM.gov. Uh, next slide. So big picture, the requirements of, of part five, you know, is, is, is to publish proposed contract actions and provide notice to contractors. And this, these requirements are driven by the Small Business Act and the Office of Federal Procurement Policy Act. Like I mentioned before, fundamental requirement it's described in, in 5.201. It states, for acquisitions of supplies and services, the contracting officer must transmit a notice to the GPE, SAM.gov, for each proposed contract action expected to exceed $25,000. Modification to an existing contract for additional supplies or services, 
again, like we talked about, outside the scope of the current contract, expected to exceed $25,000, or it also allows the government to provide, to post uh, proposed contract actions for any amount if the government determines that it would be advantageous for the government to do so. And FAR 5.201, it also explicitly tells us, sort of says the primary purpose of you know, these notice requirements is to improve small business access to acquisition information and enhance competition by identifying contracting and subcontracting opportunities. So I think that's an important theme to keep in mind as we go through the presentation that you know all of these publication requirements are really focused on allowing this sort of free flow of information to the maximum extent practicable between the government and industry to enhance competition and um, you know especially there's a, a focus on on providing opportunities um, to small businesses. Uh, next slide. So here we have the required elements um, for each notice of a proposed contract action that is posted to uh, the GPE. Uh, and so most of these elements make sense, right? They're, you know, it's, it's to provide industry with sort of the basic details um, of the opportunity. Um, you know, we have date, year, contracting office address, you know, et cetera, you know, just sort of the basic details. I will note a few that are worth a little bit more discussion. Um, number five, product or service code. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with PSCs. These are codes used by the government to describe the product, services, and, and R&D uh, that they will purchase. And so a lot of times, gov you know, the government's going to use a PSC code in these notices um, to sort of try to get a better sense of, of what contractors uh, can meet their requirements, meet their needs. And so from, a, from an industry perspective, it's important to understand PSCs. And when you're registering in SAM to ensure that you have the correct PSC codes listed, you know, that align with your company's core capabilities and, and product offerings, um, you know, so that in turn, you have the correct PSC code to, um, you know, respond to and, and bid on an opportunity. And then number 16, description. Uh, that's another one that uh, is worth, um, you know, some more detail. The, the FAR instructs the government to quote, prepare a clear and concise description of the supplies or services that is not unnecessarily restrictive of competition and will allow a prospective offer to make an informed business judgment as to whether a copy of the solicitation should be requested. And it also provides, you know, a, a list of, of further details um, that, you know, if are applicable, the government should provide in the description, you know, if they're providing, if they're acquiring products, you know, the quantity, the delivery schedule, um, the manufacturer of the, of, of the product, that kind of stuff. Um, and this is, this is an important part, right? If, if the focus of part five is, is, you know, to this exchange of information, the description needs to be sufficient. It needs to be adequate. It, it needs to not be unnecessarily restrictive of competition. Um, you know, I mean, to this point, GAO has sustained protests where the agency failed to provide an uh, inadequate description. You know, GAO found that this, you know, in, in, in this one case, that the description essentially discouraged competition. Um, you know, which goes against the whole sort of point of Part Five to increase competition and and, and small business participation. Um, so these are, you know, just overall, these are some of the, the basic details that will be provided um, in, in these notices of, of proposed contract actions on SAM.gov. Uh, next slide, please. So if you read part five, sort of start to finish, um, at least to me, I, I find it uh, can be a bit confusing um, just because 
the various publication requirements and sort of timing requirements and value thresholds are they're sort of found in a couple different spots. Um, so what I tried to do on this slide is um, put it all together in, in sort of a cohesive manner. Um, so on the next slide, we're going to talk about exceptions. Um, but setting that aside, these are sort of the, the overarching general requirements um, for, for part five. If a contract action has a proposed value below $15,000, it's not subject to any of the requirements in part five. Uh, you know, I mean, the government still has to abide by any other applicable competition requirements, et cetera. But, but for our purposes here, the action does not need to be publicized on SAM.gov. Graduating up to contract actions that have a value between $15,000 and $25,000, agencies must display in a public place or by an appropriate and equivalent electronic means a synopsis or the actual solicitation and they need to do that for at least 10 days you might ask well, what is a public place um, that's not defined in the far um, i think you know going back to sort of my earlier example of a, of a agency using its own website, right? I think that would that would satisfy this sort of equivalent electronic means portion, right? Where it doesn't need to be posted to SAM.gov, but it still needs to be made public. Um, if another another thing to note for, for this sort of threshold here is if a contracting officer posts a synopsis, so they're they're not posting a, a copy of the solicitation. Uh, then they must allow a reasonable opportunity to respond after issuing the solicitation. Again, the FAR does not define what is a reasonable opportunity to respond. Um, so it's, it's sort of left up to the contracting officer's discretion. Um, however, the FAR does give some considerations that the CEO needs to take into account. And those are you know, the complexity commerciality, availability, and urgency of the acquisition. So the, the CEO needs to take those factors into account when you know, determining how long industry has to um, respond to a solicitation. And you know, it's gotta be a, a, a reasonable amount of time. Between 25,000 and uh, $250,000, which is the simplified acquisition threshold, um, notice of a proposed contract action must be posted on SAM.gov, the GPE, and it must be posted for at least 15 days before issuance of the solicitation. And then here too, once the solicitation is out, you know, the response time for, for that um, is again, a reasonable opportunity to respond. So uh, for these lower dollar procurements, it's really left up to the CO's discretion you know, how long the solicitation is going to be out there before, um, you know, contractors need to respond to it. And then finally, we have above the simplified acquisition threshold. So this has the same 15 days before issuance of a solicitation notice needs to be posted to SAM.gov. But then here, the solicitation response time has to be at least 30 days. And then a last last note here are commercial items. Um, so there's there, there's a unique set of rules around the acquisition of, of commercial products or commercial services. Um, so um, contracting officers they, they essentially have two options, right? They they can either just establish a shorter period for issuance of a solicitation, and you know to me that that makes sense, right? Commercial items are often much more readily available products. Um, you know, the goal of the federal government sort of overarching is to align the acquisition of commercial products and commercial services, you know, as much as possible with the commercial marketplace. So if the government has a need for a commercial item, say printer paper, you know, it may make sense or you know not to require the the 15 day notice period right that they want to acquire that printer paper um on a, on a quicker timeline more streamlined timeline 
Um, the other method for, for contracting officers that they can use for the acquisition of commercial products and commercial services um, is a combined synopsis and solicitation procedure, which is described in FAR 12.603. And so that allows the CO to combine the two into a single document. Um, so under this method, the contracting officer is not required to publicize a separate synopsis 15 days before the issuance of a solicitation. They just publish this one document and then again, just have to, it's not subject to a 30 day requirement, even if it's over the $250,000 threshold for this, they just need to provide a reasonable opportunity to respond. So I think, you know, bottom line with this slide and, and really far part five generally is, you know, it's important to understand the various timelines associated with the different sized or valued procurements. And then also to be aware that there are these sort of special rules that are going to allow for a faster, more streamlined acquisition when you're talking about commercial products or commercial services. Another point here is all these requirements, these are just the minimum requirements, right? It's 30 day, at least 30 days, at least 15 days notice. If the government wants to, it can, you know, extend any of any of these um, time frames. Um, so, and that's something that it often does if it thinks that that would benefit, you know, if that would enhance competition, it would allow more contractors to respond, um, et cetera. And then finally, you know, another point I think here is, you know, just to understand the discretion that contracting officers have for commercial items and for these lower dollar procurements in terms of, you know, the reasonable opportunity uh, to respond. You know, when I was looking into cases on this topic, I even came across a a 2018 GAO decision, which I think it, you know, is a good example. Um, the agency needed commercial diesel heating fuel, and it ended up only providing a 44-minute response time for contractors to respond to the solicitation. And you know, obviously that was challenged, um, but GAO found that it actually did constitute a reasonable opportunity. Um, because the, the contracting officer explained that there were emergency circumstances, there was, you know, um, upcoming inclement weather. And so the agency, you know, essentially had a dire need for this commercial fuel before that weather hit. And 44 minutes was all, you know, it, it, it could do. And so that, that was found to be reasonable. I think that's just a good example of, you know, the, the flexibility and discretion given to, to contracting officers. I mean, they're, it still needs to be reasonable, but um, there are a lot of factors at play there that can um, that are taken into account. Uh, next slide, please. So we talked about sort of the general requirements about when a synopsis, you know, when notice needs to be provided um, to industry on the last slide. Five point two hundred two has essentially a laundry list of, of sort of exceptions to this notice requirement um, where the government is not required to post notice to SAM.gov for proposed contract action. You can see the full list here. Uh, you know, a lot of them are pretty small exceptions. Um, a couple to note that do come up um, a little bit more regularly. Uh, first, national security. If, if the notice, um, can't be written in a way where it wouldn't compromise, compromise national security, then the government is not required to abide by part five requirements. Um, the government can't rely on this exception just because a proposed contract action may involve classified work. That's important to note. It, it, it has to be if, you know, posting the notice would, would compromise national security. Uh, second one, unusual and compelling urgency. So if the proposed contract action is being made under 
you know, unusual, compelling circumstances, and the government would be seriously injured if it was required to comply with the notice requirements, uh, then it doesn't need to provide notice. You know, I, I, I go back to that example we just had with the uh, commercial diesel fuel. Um, I, you know, I the case didn't discuss this, but I'm sure there was no notice provided there because of the, you know, the urgency, the compelling circumstances, uh, you know, given the, given the weather. Uh, number four, authorized by statute. That's another one to keep in mind. You know, certain statutes may change publication requirements. If you think about uh, the 8A program, where the government may be permitted to compete opportunities only to 8A vendors um, and only need to provide notice to them. They don't need to provide notice on the same.gov. Um, similarly, orders placed under indef indefinite delivery contracts, right? The, you know, IDIQ contracts where you have a pool of prime contract holders and then you're competing the task order. Uh, you're not going to need to, the government is, is not required to provide notice of, of any task order actions on sam.gov right that notice would only be sent to uh the idiq you know uh prime contract holders so those are just a couple of the bigger exceptions the whole list is there and you can you know find additional details about when these exceptions may apply at uh, far 5.202 uh next slide please So another type of exception to the publication requirements is the use of oral quotes. Uh, FAR Part 13, which governs simplified acquisition procedures, provides that contracting officers can use oral quotes in certain circumstances, specifically for, for non-complex requirements under the simplified acquisition threshold of $250,000. That's when oral quotes can be used. At the same time, the FAR notes that oral solicitations may not be practical for contract actions exceeding $25,000. So, you know, I, I think this is this is a pretty small exception. I, I know in, in my practice, I haven't dealt too much with um, oral quotes, but um, nonetheless, it's, you know, I think it's important just to be aware that if the government does solicit um, quotes orally, then, you know, the public posting display requirements found in part five, you know, are not applicable. So this is sort of another, another type of exception. Uh, next slide, please. So thus far, we've been talking about uh, providing notice of proposed contract actions on SAM.gov. Um, but there are parts of, of part five that, um, you know, discuss other types of communications that can be posted to same.gov. Um, under certain circumstances, contracting officers must provide access to pre-solicitation notice or RFIs um, through the GPE. And in four five point two oh five, that discusses special notices um, and gives contracting officers the ability to provide other types of communications related to uh, procurements through SAM.gov, um, you know, and sort of a wide range of notices covered here, you know, long range estimates, uh, notices of pre-proposal conferences, uh, draft solicitations, uh, et cetera. And I think it's, this is important for both government and industry. Yeah, these sort of, these special notices, um, because they allow, I think, one contractors to provide additional information in a way that, you know, ultimately will help the government shape what the final opportunity or, or final solicitation will look like. And sometimes that, you know, can be to the benefit of, of contractors, right? I mean, for example, if, if the government, you know, posts an RFI and receives um, a lot of feedback that, it would have adequate competition for from small businesses to um, perform a certain requirement, then the government may decide to set aside that opportunity for small businesses. Um, and I think these early on in the in the life cycle um, 
notices and exchange of information on SAM.gov. It also provides an opportunity for industry to educate the government on, on their capabilities and maybe you know innovative solutions that the government hadn't even considered, um, that type of thing. So I think just you know, bottom line with this with this slide is I think with SAM.gov, people often just focus on the release of the solicitation itself or, or the notice uh, that proposed contract action is, is forthcoming. But, um, you know, SAM.gov and, and, and four part five also service the front end of the acquisition lifecycle and really allows for this early on exchange of information between uh, government and, and contractors. Uh, next slide. So now switching gears to uh, solicitations themselves. Uh, part five requires contracting officers to make solicitations available on SAM.gov unless uh, three exceptions. Disclosure would compromise the national security. The nature of the file does not make it cost effective or practical, or an agency senior procurement executives uh, has a written determination that access through uh, the GPE is not in the government's interest. A few other notes with solicitations. If the government is relying at all on you know, brand name specifications as part of the procurement, then any applicable justification needs to also be posted alongside the solicitation. Uh, for small businesses, so FAR 5.102 has some special rules for small businesses. And I think these, this goes back to all of these requirements arising out of the Small Business Act and the, and the government's emphasis on expanding um, small business opportunities and, and expanding the industrial base. So the contracting officer, upon request from a small business, must provide um, with respect to a particular opportunity, must provide a copy of the solicitation, uh, the relevant uh, you know, contracting point, point of contact, and any compliance obligations that would be applicable to the procurement. And then finally, if a, if a procurement is not conducted under full and open competition, um, the contracting officer must provide copies of the solicitation um, to firms that requ that request such a copy if they were not initially solicited in the procurement. And so I think this goes, and we'll touch, talk about this a little bit more later, but this sort of goes, I think, to part five as um, a way of increasing transparency um, between uh, the government and industry. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide lists the requirements in FAR 5.206, which I think is sort of an interesting section because it directs, it's directed at contractors uh, transmitting notices, posting notices um, to SAM.gov, not the government like we've been discussing. And I, you know, I, when I think of SAM.gov, I think of the government issuing notices. So um, I think a lot of people are sometimes surprised by this one, but it provides that the following entities may transmit a notice to SAM.gov. A contractor awarded a contract exceeding $250,000 that is likely to result in the award of any subcontracts, or a subcontractor at any tier under a contract exceeding $250,000 that has a subcontracting opportunity exceeding $15,000. And they can do this, they can transmit this notice in order to seek competition for subcontracts to increase participation by you know, very small business concerns uh, and to meet established subcontract, subcontracting plan goals. And if one of these entities does transmit a notice, you know, the notice needs to describe the opportunity, any pre-qualification requirements, and also uh, where to obtain technical data needed to respond to the requirement. 
And so again, I just, uh, I, I think this is a good part of part five to, to know just, it, you know, I think folks typically think of contract, don't typically think of contractors posting notices to SAM.gov. But again, I think this makes sense. It aligns with the goal of increasing opportunities for small businesses um, and, you know, by facilitating competition for, for subcontracts. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to everything we've discussed, you know, posting notice of um, proposed contract actions, RFIs, special notices, et cetera, part five also requires contract award notices to be, po to be published to SAM.gov. Uh, in particular, contract awards exceeding $25,000 that are uh, covered by trade agreement or likely to result in the award of any subcontracts. And I'll, I'll note this language here in, in number two, likely to result in the award of any subcontracts. That's written pretty broadly. Um, so, I, you know, in my mind, if there is any sort of expectation that a, a subcontract may result, that a uh, contract award notice is, is likely going to be publicized, you know, pursuant to this requirement. And again, that's that that's geared at providing small businesses with information so that they can seek out subcontract opportunities. And then also contract awards exceeding two simplified acquisition threshold of two hundred fifty thousand dollars that were either awarded under an IDIQ or under a schedule contract. Uh, those contract award notices need to be uh, published to, to SAM. Um, one thing to note, the government is, is obviously permitted to publicize contract awards below these amounts if they deem that to be advantageous to the government or to industry. Um, but these are just sort of the minimum requirements um, in terms of posting contract awards. There are a few exceptions that can be found in 5.301B, uh, nothing major though. And then 5.301D covers when contract award notices must also include justifications. Um, uh, this is typically when the contract was awarded using other than full and open competition. In that case, the award notice is posted, but then also the justification for why competition was limited um, will also be posted. And then final note, when a contract award is above $4.5 million, um, the contracting officer is required to make information available so the agency can publish notice of the award at 5 p.m. that same day. So for these higher dollar contract awards, there's um, a bit of urgency in terms of, of getting, of, of publishing um, and announcing that award. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll briefly discuss uh, 5.6, which is publicizing multi-agency use contracts. I think it's just good to be aware that there is a government-wide database of contracts um, and other procurement instruments that are going to be used by multiple agencies. So if you think about GWACs, IDIQs, schedule contracts, those all can be found on this database. And contracting officers are obligated to update award information in this database. I think it's within 10 days of an award. So again, I you know it, if you actually go to the um, to this database, it's pretty antiquated looking, um, but I think there's there's good information on there. So it's uh, just good to know that that it's out there in, in case you ever need it. Next slide, please. So this is the final area we're going to touch on today in terms of different subparts of part five. So 5.4 is titled release of information. So I think the government recognized that, you know, with all these various publication requirements that industry may be a bit concerned about the possibility of confidential business or proprietary information being improperly released. Um, so this subpart obligates contracting officers to maintain a high level of business security and to make sure information is not improperly released or discussed. 
at the same time, it does it states that information should be shared to the maximum extent practicable. But you know, anything that would give any type of advantage, competitive advantage, anything that is received in confidence from a contractor, um, any information that would be protected under FOIA or the Privacy Act. Um, and any internal government communications, you know, all all that type of information cannot be released, and you know, contracting officers need to handle with care to make sure that it's not improperly disclosed. So I think that it's just important to flag 5.4 for contractors, just so they're aware that there are sufficient protocols in place to protect confidential information. The government's aware of the concern and you know i think it's trying to strike a balance between sharing as much information as possible to you know facilitate the exchange of information between government and industry but at the same time you know protect private and commercial interests uh, next slide so we've alluded touched on this throughout the presentation, but what what is the point of part five? Like, what are the benefits? I think obviously, first off, requiring that contracting opportunities be publicized increases competition, right? It broadens industry participation. And like we've seen with a lot of the, the obligations in, in part five, there's a real emphasis on providing more opportunities and information to small businesses. And in theory, you know, that will increase small business participation in the marketplace, helps the government government meet, you know, its small business contracting goals. And all that sort of just goes hand in hand with the overarching goal of the government to have a diverse and broad set of contractors in the industrial base. I think this increased competition it allows for the government to obtain better prices for the goods and services it procures um, it also allows the government to obtain higher quality goods and services and like we touched on earlier i think it it, it increases the likelihood that efficiencies and, and innovations can be offered by industry and acknowledged and incorporated into final opportunities by uh, by the government and then finally, these publication requirements, I, I think it helps promote fairness, openness, leads to public trust, um, you know, just provides more transparency to industry. And, you know, I think ideally along the same lines, uh, aids in preventing waste, fraud, and abuse. So, I mean, I, to me, I, I, at least I know personally, I, I oftentimes sort of overlook part five. Um, but it does serve an important purpose in federal acquisition regulation and in the procurement life cycle. Uh, next slide. Uh, so to conclude, just a few final points. Um, part five, it should be seen as an avenue for increasing competition, increasing transparency uh, between government and contractors. And Contractors should take full advantage of this flow of information, right? I mean, monitor SAM.gov for contract action notices for potential opportunities to bid on. You know, review those contract award notices for potential subcontracting opportunities. Um, it's a it's a really valuable resource that um, should be utilized. All that said, I you know I will caveat that SAM.gov should not be the end all be all, right? I, I, it's also important to develop relationships with the government and your relevant points of contact. I think the best place to be is, you know, most of the time to be aware that an opportunity or a notice is about to hit SAM.gov even before it does. And so once it does hit SAM.gov, you know, you can really hit the ground running. Uh, but with that, that concludes the presentation. Um, Thanks so much for attending and I'll turn it back over to Sophia. Thank you, Connor, for a very informative presentation and thanks for anyone who joined us today also. As mentioned, you can always catch the recording on our YouTube channel within 24 hours and find over 600 webinars of government contracting there uh, as well. 
Um, and also a friendly reminder that tickets are going fast for our winter soiree. Please join us in many federal agencies and departments on Monday, February 12th. Uh, and you can just sign up for that by going to our website and selecting the events tab, scroll down to the event, and we hope to see you there. And that's it for today's webinar. Thank you again to our speaker, Connor Farrell, and everybody who joined us. We hope you have a great weekend.